It's so kind that you would clap for me, but come on. Anybody grateful for Jesus in the room? Anybody realize, come on. It's God's mercy and His grace that woke you up this morning, started you on your way. His breath is in our lungs. Come on. His blood is flowing through our veins. So God, we love you. And God, we give this next 30 some odd minutes to you. God, do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. This isn't our service. It's your service. Be blessed, God. In Jesus' name. Come on. Can we say amen? amen. Uh, who was here when I preached in February? Anybody was here? Oh, that's everybody. All right. Hey, so I was black back then. And I'm still black, baby. I'm good. I'm black, okay? I'm black. So I told you this back in February, and it just bears repeating, okay? Um, I was black then. I'm black now, which means, come on, we say amen at church. Okay? I want, I want you to help me feel at home, okay? And uh, the church I grew up at is a holla back church, okay? Uh, the church I'm from does not feel like a library. It feels like a, like a concert venue, you know? And so um, the church mothers, man, they will shout you down. So, um, so this is a good participatory Sunday. And this is my beautiful wife. We've been married for seven years. That's my girl right there. And um, uh, she... she is uh, mentally preparing herself to give birth to our first son. Uh, and I'm super excited and, and uh, it's a miracle, an absolute miracle. So um, I said to the Lord, uh, back when we first started battling with infertility, I said, God, um, I will preach about infertility even if you don't give me any children um, because faith is not for results, faith is for relationship with God. The Bible says this in Hebrews 11:6, 6, and without faith, it is impossible to what? Anyone know? Please God. The faith isn't just to get results. So I use faith, and last year we had a miscarriage. And even in the miscarriage, guess what? The enemy wants to, me to believe that the faith was a waste because the result didn't happen. But can I encourage you? A lot of times our faith wavers because we believe that faith is results-oriented. Faith is not results-oriented. Faith is relationship-oriented. Your faith pleases God. Come on, your faith pleases God. So even when the results don't shake out the way that we want, our faith pleases God. Come on, I had faith that somebody was gonna become a Christian. They didn't. Guess what? My faith still pleased God because I evangelized. I shared my faith. Come on, I believed that uh, we can improve our economic situation. I've been tithing and giving and sowing in faith. And even if the results don't work out, even if I stay unemployed, even if the business venture doesn't work, guess what? My faith pleased God. The faith is not results oriented. I got to a place with our infertility battle with like Paul. I said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If we never have a baby, I'm just gonna be the crazy person that's preaching about faith because I, my faith is not results oriented. Even if we have no children, I will just preach on the fact that God can get us through the valley, he's good. And then I told God, but if you do give us a child, I'll talk about it all the time. I'll talk about this miracle. So the devil's got a problem with me I, one way or the other. So if we don't have a kid, I'm gonna be preaching about it. If we do have a kid, I'm gonna be preaching about it. Come on, is there anybody in the sanctuary today who's like, no matter what happens, the devil's gonna have a problem with me. I'm gonna give Satan a headache no matter the results, no matter what happens, I'm gonna be faithful. No matter what happens, I'm gonna be faithful. We can't, uh, we cannot unhinge faith from faithfulness. Should have got a good amen right there. <laughs> so often when we preach about faith, we forget that to have faith means to live a faithful life. Come on. We got a lot of people who preach on being faith-filled but not faithful. It's one thing to be faith-filled. I believe God for the miraculous. I believe God that he can do exceeding and abundantly above all that I can ask, think, or imagine. But even if, come on, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayer, Nebuchadnezzar, even if God doesn't, we still ain't bowing down to your golden image. I'm not just faith-filled, but I'm faithful faithful. So I'm excited. I'm going to preach a little bit about faith today. And this is a two-part sermon. So to get the second part, that means you got to come back at 6 p.m. 
It's 6 p.m., right, Pastor? Not 6.30. It's 6 p.m. tonight. So in order to get uh, part two of this message, you got to come back at 6 p.m. And uh, I'm just super excited. I feel like I'm back at home. It's better to be in Iowa in June than in February. That is for sure. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for loving me and bringing me back in June, okay? Uh, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Jeannie, thank you so much for having me. I love you guys so much. Uh, I told them this yesterday, but I was like, you got a black son now, so you're kind of stuck with me. So uh, I feel like I'm part of the family. I love Iowa. Anybody ready for the word? Anybody ready for the word this morning? Okay. Go to Luke chapter 8. Come on. Anybody got a physical Bible in church? Come on. I got my physical Bible. I'm feeling spiritual. Anybody got a physical Bible in church? Uh, whether you got to open your Bible or turn it on. Anybody got an iPhone? any iPhone users out there, come on, turn on your Bible. Go ahead, turn on your Bible. Any Android users, just put that away. <laughs> just... <laughs> we don't know if it works. We don't, we don't know. <laughs> we don't need any blurry pictures from church today. Uh, I'm just joking. I'm just, I'm joking. If you're offended, email uh, P-A-S-T-O-R-J-E-F-F -F at New Hope. <laughs> <laughs> That's my email. It'll come right to me. It'll come right to me. <laughs> Let's go to Luke chapter 8. It's on the screens for you. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. And uh, because we're all black in here, we're going to do call and response. Uh, so if there's a word that I don't say, uh, that means it's your turn to say the word that I don't say. Okay. And so, yes, you heard right. We're all black today. So Amen. there we go. Amen. Uh, if you ever were like, man, I wish I was black, today's the day, all right? Today's the day. Here we go. Uh, it says this in Luke chapter 8. We're going to start reading in verse 22. It says, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. Everything's normal at this point, right? Okay, next verse. As they sailed, Jesus fell. Jesus fell. Uh, whew, here we go. I, I almost want to start preaching already. Okay, let's keep going. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being and they were in great danger. danger. Verse 24. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to Brown. Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Here we go. We're gonna center our, our, our sermon today around this question. Verse 25, where is your faith? Oh, come on, I wanna ask that to everybody today. Where is your faith? If you're taking notes, you're gonna write that down or circle that in your Bible. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? I shared last night that I have the kind of mom who like doesn't ask, she asks questions, but these questions are never questions. And I'm wondering if your mom's like my mom or maybe your wife's like this. Like for instance, right, uh, we, were, we were all at the house, like we went to our parents' house to kind of get dressed and get ready because we were all going out for like a big birthday celebration. And I came out uh, of my brother's room dressed and my, my mother says, is that what you're wearing? <laughs> See, that's a question, but that's not a question. <laughs> that is a question, but what she meant is, I don't want you to wear that, wear something else, right? Uh, God is quite similar. You realize that Jesus doesn't need to ascertain any information from anybody. Like, he's omniscient. He knows everything. So whenever you see in the Bible where God starts asking questions like, where are you, Adam? Or who told you you were naked? Or Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? That's a great place, if you're a good Bible student, to highlight questions that God asks because God is never asking questions because he needs information. God is a lot like my mama. She is asking questions because really she's making statements. Where is your he asked his disciples, in fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds in the water, and they obey him. God, we know that there's probably some people in the room right now who are going through a storm. So God, I need you to speak today. I don't need me to speak. I, I, I really, we want the Holy Spirit to speak. So God, would you speak clearly? We can't preach without you. We can't teach without you. We can't have church without you. God, I can give information and ideas and break down the word, 
But it's your Holy Spirit that knocks on hearts. It's your Holy Spirit that transforms lives. It's your Holy Spirit that takes generalities from the stage and makes it specific to every person. So, God, we need you to do that. So, God, give us your grace today. This is all for you, your, your kingdom and your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, can we all say amen together? Amen. amen. Uh, it's funny, I, I was out to eat uh, with, with Luke and Zach last night, and, and I'm traveling with this awesome 19-year-old over here named Jayon, okay? And, and Jayon, I've known Jayon since he was 12 years old. He was in my youth ministry, and now he's all cool, and he does graphic design and makes all these fancy slides and does video, and he's, he's amazing. He's super creative, and it, I've become keenly aware that me and Jayon live in different realities, like, we live in different worlds. Me, me and Jayon live in two different worlds. He is 19, I'm 33 years old. And, and, and I said last night, we're out to dinner, and I said, yeah, remember MapQuest? <laughs> and Jayon is like, I don't know what that is, I don't know what you're talking about. And me, Zach, and Luke be like, yeah, MapQuest.com. <laughs> remember MapQuest.com, right? You had to go on mapquest.com, you had to punch in where you start, you had to punch in your destination, and then you printed out physical sheets of paper and followed directions. And Jayon is literally, he said the words, you're speaking Chinese to me, I don't, I don't. And I said, Jayon, when did you get your first iPhone? He said, I was nine years old. I was like, yeah, we are living in different worlds. You don't know what map, but you don't know mapquest.com. And some of you are like, I used to buy maps, yeah. okay? <laughs> maps, <laughs> MapQuest is high tech. <laughs> like, <laughs> we had maps, all right? We're highlight 995. Like, we just got the maps, like, in the back, okay? Barnes and Nobles, like, maps of the United States, you know? Uh, some of you are older than me, some of you are my age, some of you are younger than me. They're just different experiences. And so, so I said, okay, Jayon, um, you realize that there was a day, not too long ago, if you wanted to get a girlfriend, you had to like use your legs. <laughs> and you had to physically walk over to a female. This is crazy. Not your thumbs, buddy, your legs. <laughs> You couldn't just DM her or text her. No, no, no. You had to use your legs. You had to walk. You had to get a breast mint. You had to have a funny joke, you know? You had, you had to, like, have some courage, you know? You, like, actually needed to talk. And guess what, Jayon? When she gave you her phone number, if you were successful at ascertaining her phone number, it wasn't a cell phone, buddy. It's a home phone, a landline phone. And when you got the landline phone, your biggest worry was, is her parent going to pick up the phone? <laughs> Jayon is like, I don't know what you are talking about. I don't know this reality. I've never called a landline. And I'm just like, you were deprived. <laughs> you were deprived. This is so sad. This is so sad. This isn't even spoiled. It's deprived. You've been deprived of normal, like, relational activity. And, and can anybody remember, say, oh, I'm getting a lot of amens. This is good. Come on. Like, and, and, and I said, Jayon, hey, ha, I remember AOL. <laughs> Internet trials. Stick the disc in the, and he's like, disc? What's a disc? I'm like, oh, my God. What's a disc? So then, you know, for the remainder of the evening, I'm explaining LimeWire and Napster and, and AOL Instant Messenger. And we're just, you know, trying to catch him up to speed on, like, normal people activities. And I said, you know, it's funny because at my house, you know, you know, parents answered the phone. And you couldn't, you didn't call people after, like, 10 p.m. Like, once it hit the double digits, it was over. You know, you're not calling other people's houses. Because, you know, somebody's dad is going to answer the phone. Like, who is this? And it's like, uh, <laughs> like, uh, it's no one. <laughs> like, it's, just, it's like, so you had to kind of coordinate with your girlfriend. If you wanted to talk late at night, you had to, like, be real coordinated about it, you know? And I told Jayon, you couldn't be on the phone and the internet at the same time. And he's just like, what? 
I'm like, yeah, man, it's called dial-up modem. What, what, where have you been? He was like, I wasn't born, you know? And I said, well, I had a trick for how to talk to my girlfriend late at night because my parents had this rule, you know, you can't talk past 10. You're not calling other people's houses and no one's calling this house past 10 uh, for the landline telephone. I remember we had this slick technology. It's called a cordless phone. Anybody remember cordless phones? Oh man, that was sweet. I remember my parents, we had a station wagon. There was a car phone. Remember the car phone? Wow, it was attached to the middle console. That was fancy. Tom Toms, Garmin, GPS. Any, any. We're walking down memory lane. My ADHD is going to get a hold of me fast. Okay, here we go. It's back on track. Don't distract me. <laughs> I said, you know, I had a trick for how I would talk to my girlfriend like late at night on the phone. He said, you know, I would, I would call 411. I would get the cordless phone, bring it into my room, and I would call 411. Now 411 is the information. It's like the weather. You call 411 and it's like, yeah, it is 7, it is 1002 in Boston, Massachusetts. The weather is 72 degrees with 25% humidity, beep. It is Boston, Massachusetts, and it is 1003. And it's just on and on and on and on. Anybody ever call 411? Come on. Okay, all right, a couple people. But you're waiting. I would just stay on the line with 411 for however long, and then I would hear that beep beep. And the beep beep would let me know somebody's on the other line. I'd hear the beep beep, and I'd be like, hey, girl. She's like, how'd you answer the phone so fast? I'm like, girl, I'm grown, you know what I'm saying? I do what I want to do. Meanwhile, I'm just, I just hit a cordless phone in my bedroom, you know what I'm saying? And, and anybody remember ever being on a phone, and it's late at night, you're talking about nothing. What are you doing? Not nothing. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? It's just meaningless conversation. But, you know, you just like this person so much you want to stay on the phone with them. And then all of a sudden you're like, you're spilling your heart out. You're talking about your day. You're, you know, talking about school or whatever. And then all of a sudden you hear. <laughs> Come on. Anybody ever been falling asleep on before when you're talking on the phone? And then you try to punch the little digits, the numbers on the screen to try to wake them up. Come on. Like, it, it's so sad. You're like, I'm talking. I'm done. Like, how long have you been sleeping? I don't know how long. You've been, I, what do I need to repeat? You're, you think you've been falling asleep on. And a lot of us, come on, if you've ever been talking and you feel like somebody fell asleep on you, you're like frustrated because you're like, man, you fell asleep at the wrong time. And I bet this is exactly how the disciples feel in Luke chapter 8. Jesus is sleeping in a boat, but it is not the right time to be asleep because there's a whole storm that's broken out and Jesus is nowhere to be found because he is sleeping. Okay, this is where all the perfect Christians who never doubt God or are disappointed with God can leave the room. Now, all of us real Christians, come on, have you ever felt like in the middle of your storm Jesus was sleeping? Oh, you could hear him clearly when everything was going okay, like you and Jesus are walking around when everything is rosy and peachy, but the moment a storm breaks out, it's like Jesus is like, peace, <laughs> sleep, no answer. And, and I kind of want to help us today because for a lot of us, our faith can waver because we can feel disappointed in the fact that Jesus, when I needed you the most, you were kind of knocked out. <laughs> And sleep. And I hope we can be real today in church and not be fake. <laughs> if we're going to be real, sometimes it's in the storms of life where Jesus chooses to take a nap. <laughs> it's like, now? <laughs> now? You wanted to, you got sleepy now? <laughs> in the middle of my storm? We're going to die, you know? I, I need you to get this. I need you to paint this. I need to paint this picture for you. Because the disciples are so scared, they think they're going to die. Now, these are fishermen, okay? These people have lived their life on boats on the water, fishermen. For a fisherman to be scared of a storm, it means the storm was pretty bad. Like, come on. I remember one time I was flying back from England. I was flying to Boston, Massachusetts, where I was living, and I was on Icelandic air, and the turbulence was really bad. Like, it was, it was abnormal. It felt like a roller coaster in the sky. It was just like, and, and, the, and, and whenever there's uh, turbulence, 
I have a little trick. Now let's look at the flight attendant. Because they're always calm. The plane could be going crazy, and the flight attendant's just like, do you want some Coke? And it's like, ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Is it okay to give me Coke right now? Because this plane seems like it's like falling apart. The flight attendant's always cool, calm, and collected. So that's always my trick. I always look at the flight attendant, and the peace on their face typically kind of helps me to be calm. But this day, I'm on Icelandic Air flying over the Atlantic Ocean, coming back from the UK to Boston, and the flight attendant did one of these. <laughs> she sat in her little seat, buckled herself in, and did a sign of a cross. And at that point, I thought to myself, okay, if the flight attendant is scared, maybe it's time to freak out, you know? Like, clearly she knows something I don't know. And we were fine, clearly we landed. I'm alive, I'm here, okay? But I want to paint this picture. Fishermen who have lived their life on the water, on a boat, are scared in a storm. Which means the danger is not made up. This is not a figment of their imagination. They have all the right to be scared. Can I tell you something? If there's a storm in your life, I get it. It's real pain. There's real issues. Like a negative doctor's report is a real thing. The threat of foreclosure is real. And sometimes in church world, we can over-spiritualize things and make it seem like your struggle's not that bad. Baby, no, 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 I get it. It is that bad. We don't need to minimize the storm to elevate God. No, no, no. We need to elevate God. That doesn't minimize the fact that the storm is bad. The storm is bad. I'm just saying we've got to put our faith someplace else. So in all of this, here we go. I can imagine the disciples huddling up. And the disciples are like, wait a whole second. A whole second. How is it that we, we, we've sacrificed our homes, we've left our families, we dropped our nets to follow Jesus, and now we're about to die? Where the woman with the issue of blood didn't do any of that. She just met Jesus, got her miracle, and she's off to the races, living a whole new life. Okay, not in Iowa, but in North Carolina. You know, sometimes the people at my church, we can struggle with comparing what Jesus is doing in other people's lives to what Jesus is doing in my life. Come on, imagine the disciples. Wait, if anybody deserves Jesus to wake up and fix this, it is us. We have left homes, we have left our families, we have sacrificed, come on. I've been tithing, I've been giving, I've been volunteering. No, not y'all, okay, just in North Carolina, okay. How'd their son get a scholarship and not mine? How'd their daughter, wait, why are we struggling with this? Come on, have you ever, no, okay, don't, don't, oh, woo. Have you ever prayed prayers to kind of manipulate God? Uh-oh. Like God, <laughs> I've been blank, 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 like, you know, I deserve for you to do this for me. In the middle of the disciples, Having this imaginary huddle in my mind, Jesus wakes up. I love this. Jesus wakes up, and he's got a poignant question. Verse 25, Luke chapter 8, verse 25. Here we go. Where is your faith? Now, 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 uh, I love this. Uh, if I asked you where are your keys, that means you have car. keys and a car. Yeah. If I said where is your car, that means you have a if I said, where's your wife? That means you have a? If I said, where's your husband? That means you have a? Jesus says, where is your faith? Which means they have faith. This is not a question about whether they have faith. This is a question about where their faith is currently located. Now, Jesus is a master of measuring faith. But this passage is not about the measurement of their faith. It's about the misplacement of their faith. And we're gonna keep coming back to this question. Where is your faith? Because, uh-oh, if your faith is in the job, if your faith is in the company you work for, if your faith is in your boss or the president of that company, I get it, uh, but see, your job is a resource. It's not the source. God is Jehovah Jireh. He's the one that provides for your needs, and at some point, you're gonna have to take your faith out of that company and in 
to the place where it should be, which is Jesus. Pastor Jeff is an amazing pastor. Pastor Jeannie is an amazing, oh my God, Pastor Weaver's awesome. He gave me a noogie last night. He's great, but guess what? If I place my faith in a man, man fails. I have to place my faith where? In God. See, my faith isn't in my spouse, it's not in the doctors. No, no, no. My faith, where is your faith? Where is it? A lot of our marriages are falling apart because we put so much pressure on our spouse to be everything that really God can only be for us. Where's your faith? Where is it? And we can make idols out of people really fast when we start putting all of our faith in them. Oh, I'm preaching. Oh, I'm preaching. Oh, oh, I'm preaching good. You know how I many people I know? Pastor loses his mind, has an affair, and now the church is falling. Whoa, whoa, whoa. was your faith in a man or was it in God? If your faith was in God, somebody's moral life did not affect me. My faith is in Jesus, not in your ability to be holy. Hello. See, I'm preaching. You feel uncomfortable. I can feel it in the room. Where is your faith? Where is it? Where is it? This is a question we have to constantly ask ourselves. Where have I put my faith? Come on, I lose my keys every day. Doesn't mean I don't have keys. It just means right now they're misplaced. Come on. Jesus, to, to, to the centurion, he says what? You have great faith. To some people, he says, your faith healed you. To other people, he says, you have little faith. But then I love this, like this is like the insult, but like he comes back after it because after he says, you have little faith, he then says, well, all you need is this faith out of a mustard seed and you can move a mountain. And it's like, you know, Jesus like insults him, but then like, you know, he's like, ah, it's not that bad though, you know? <laughs> so Jesus, what? All throughout the gospels, Jesus measures faith. But this passage is not about the measurement of faith. It's about the misplacement of faith. So we have to redefine three words. If, if we're gonna ask the question, here we go. This is the question that we need to answer. Where was the disciples' faith, okay? Where was their faith? Because it's gonna be hard for us to apply this passage to us if we don't know where their faith was, okay? So we gotta ask the question, where was their faith? But before we can answer that question, We've got to redefine three words. I want to redefine three words for us. Here we go. If you're taking notes, write this down. First word we got to redefine is fear. Fear. What is fear? Well, fear is simply the humble acknowledgement that something is stronger than me. That's it. In every church across America, across the globe, two groups of people walked into church today. Two groups of people. One person walked in thinking, oh my God, I can't sing that well. I don't know if my neighbor can hear me. No, I don't want to draw attention to myself. If I lift my hands off, people are going to look at me. Those people are operating under the fear of man. And this is a totally different group of people that walked into church today. And they're like, I will lift up my hands, even, man, I don't care if I put deodorant on or not, I'm lifting up these hands, okay? Like, I will sing, I will make a joyful noise unto the Lord, whatever slides are up there, this ain't Christian karaoke, baby, this moves the heart of God. So I'm singing, I'm all about this, why? Because those people are under the fear of God, not the fear of man. So we've gotta redefine fear. Fear is not a bad thing or a good thing, it's just a neutral thing. It's who you're afraid of that dictates how you're gonna proceed with your life. Fear is not bad, fear is not good. The real question is, what are you afraid of? Because the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. For there to be something in your presence that's stronger than you, greater than you, and for you to not be afraid is actually foolish. Fear is great, fear protects people. Fear is not good or bad, here we go, next word. Worry, what is worry? We gotta redefine worry. Because I'll be honest with you, I'll be vulnerable since I'm here all week, you know. I have ADHD. I was on Adderall all throughout college. I mean, my wife met me medicated, you know. Fell in love with me, and then I stopped taking the Adderall. I was like, gotcha, you know. <laughs> I call ADHD my superpower. My wife does not agree. <laughs> She's like, I sent you to the grocery store to get eggs. You came back with like a, a grill and trash bags. Like, I don't know what happened, you know. <laughs> my wife has to remind me of things 15,000 times. Like, I actually have ADHD, but I like it. I call it my superpower. It helps me to preach, so I'm, I, you know, it's fine. But you know what works better than Adderall? 
to keep me concentrated? No. <laughs> worry. Because you know what worry is? The ability to concentrate, undistracted, for prolonged amounts of time, which lets me know something. If you can worry, then that means you can meditate, baby. And if you can meditate on the problem, you know what you can do? You can meditate on the solution. It means that your mind works. It means that you can take the same ingredients and cook a different meal. All worry is is worship in reverse. All worry is is meditating on a problem where you can use that same brain to meditate on the God that is present with you. What does it mean that God is present? It means that he is pre-sent. It means that he sent himself ahead of your problem so that he can be the I am that I am that you need him to be. If you can worry, you can worry worship because all worry is is worship in reverse you can worry great good news you can meditate awesome switch the object of your worry then and start meditating on the goodness of God on the faithfulness of God I can't believe how great this is going to work out for me what do you mean you worry that just means your brain works it means you got the right tools and you're building the wrong thing What's anxiety? Here we go, third word we gotta redefine. Anxiety, awesome. You struggle with anxiety, good news. That's great. You struggle with fear, you struggle with worry, that's awesome. Anxiety, great. What is anxiety? What are most people anxious about? Stuff that hasn't happened yet? What typically happens when you're anxious? The stuff that you're anxious about happens? But you know what anxiety does? Pulls your future into your present moment. You know what anxiety is? Your ability to create and imagine your future. If you are going to use your brain to build a tomorrow that is filled with doom and disaster and destruction, then how about you use that same God-given brain to build a reality for tomorrow that is full of his blessing and his goodness and his mercy and his grace. If you can imagine things, here we go, if you're gonna waste your time imagining things about tomorrow, why not let them be good things? What? Anxiety? We are so up in arms about anxiety as a culture. We hear the word anxiety, we're like, oh my God, that's a problem. Anxiety, bad. <laughs> Says who? Said who? Maybe anxiety is just a check engine light to let you know what to pray for. Maybe anxiety is God's ability to alert you of the things that you actually need to steer in his direction. Anxiety, who said it's a bad thing? Fear, worry, anxiety? These sound like, I don't know, tomato sauce, some type of, uh, some type of meat, and I don't know, some type of pasta. And guess what? With those ingredients, you can make lasagna, you can make spaghetti, you can make pizza, you can make all types of things. What you make with the same ingredients is up to you. Fear, worry, and anxiety are just ingredients. How you use those ingredients is completely up to you. Amen. So here we go. Verse eight, chapter eight, verse 25. I got five minutes, we're gonna do this. Where is your faith? Where was their faith? Where was the disciples' faith? In the storm. Their faith was in the storm. Because faith isn't a good thing or a bad thing. Faith is just something that works. If you put your faith in the wrong thing, it's gonna bring the wrong thing into your life. Faith isn't just some good thing. No, if you have faith in Buddha, it's gonna destroy your life, period. Faith is just faith, faith works. Their faith was where? In the storm. Look at what they say in the verse before, verse 24. We're going to drown. They were certain of what the storm had the power to do. They were convinced this storm can kill us. Here we go, here's the word. They were impressed by the storm. Where's your faith right now? Where is it? 
Is it in the storm that's currently raging out of control in your life? Is that where your faith is? Because I'll tell you this right now. If your faith is in the storm, then the storm will only get stronger. It will only grow. It will only gain more power. If you give your faith to the storm, faith works. If you put your faith in God, it works. If you put your faith in the storm, it works. Just like fear, anxiety, and worry, these are not good or bad things. These are neutral things. Faith in the wrong thing will destroy your life. Here we go. How do I know that their faith is in the storm? What does Jesus say? Jesus got up and what? He got up and rebuked. Who? Rebuked. Things only need to be rebuked if they're being what? Disobedient. Okay. We all love the Bible, right? Bible. This side of the room especially, right? Come on. We love the Bible. Okay. What does Satan want more than anything? Worship. Worship is what got him kicked out of heaven. He wanted to what? Receive glory instead of reflect glory. He wants worship. When he meets Jesus in the wilderness, what does he say? If you would bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kings of the earth. Satan wants worship more than he wants anything else. And you know what he'll do to get it? He'll wrap himself up in the winds and the waves of life and make you put your faith in what the doctor said instead of what God said. Make you put your faith in what the loan officer said instead of what God said. Make you put your faith in all the craziness that your teenager's going through right now instead of what God said while you were pregnant with that teenager. Every single time the enemy wants worship, he doesn't show up at your house with a pitchfork and horns. He just wraps himself up in the waves and the winds of life. He wraps himself up in storms. I'm getting my doctoral degree right now, so I'm going to get real nerdy on you. But Baal in the Old Testament, Baal, a lot of people say Baal. Baal was just a storm god. <laughs> the storm god. The biggest idol that Israel struggled with was a storm god. You want to know where some of our faith is right now? In the storm god. In the storm. You're impressed with what the doctors have said. I'm telling you right now. Six years ago, doctors looked me and my wife in the eye and said, you'll never have children. And instead of being impressed with your medical degree, I'm just impressed with God. I, I, you're just a man. What are you talking? You're just a human. You, what you say about my life does not dictate my life. My parents were total out of control. Like they put bills in my name when I was two and three years old and my credit got all jacked up and a loan officer told me, well, you'll never own property because you're, and you don't have power. Oh, I can be impressed with your little desk and your little office or I can go, yeah, but God said I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above only and never beneath. I'm not impressed by storms. I'm not impressed by this storm. Storm don't phase me. There's a God in your boat who's asleep. And the question is this, are you going to have faith in the God who's sleeping in your boat or faith in the storm that's raging out of control? Come on, if you're in a storm today, I'm preaching to you. Here's what I love. Here we go. Let's go to verse 22. Verse 22. What's this say? One day Jesus said to his, here we go. Listen to this. Let us go over to the other of the Wait, 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 wait. Jesus says, hey guys, let's go over to the other side of the lake. Then Jesus falls asleep. They start sailing to the other side of the lake and there's a storm. When the storm breaks out, here we go. Here's the only question that matters. As you look around at the storm, you go, oh wow, this is bad, it's terrible. But here's the question. Does this look like the other side of the lake? Nope. This doesn't look like the other side of the lake. And God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he would change his mind. If Jesus said that we're going to go to the other side of the lake, then there's no hell, no devil, no storm that can stop me from getting to the other side of the lake. The reason that he can go to sleep is because he spoke before he went to sleep. What did he say? Did he say you'd get to the other side of the lake? Because God is not, God says this, my word will never return to me void. 
it will accomplish exactly what I've set out for it to accomplish. God was not just giving you some direction. He spoke prophetically and authoritatively over your life and said, we're going to the other side of the lake, which means you just keep moving forward. You put one foot in front of the other. You keep waking up. You keep choosing hope. You keep choosing faith. You keep forgiving. You keep being flexible. Why? because we're getting to the other side of the lake. Why would I let the storm stop me? Here we go. You know that God's word always attracts storms. You got to think, what is the enemy trying to stop? There's got to be something so great on the other side of this lake that the enemy's like, no, if I can steal their faith, they'll never make it. What's your other side of the lake? What's your other side of the lake? Your teenager's putting you through a storm right now? Okay, can you remember what God said when you were pregnant though? Like, come on, if there's another side of the lake and in this moment you can choose. I'm gonna give my faith to the storm. I'm gonna give my anxiety to the storm. I'm gonna give my worry to the storm. I'm gonna give my fear to the storm. Or, no, I'm afraid of the Lord. No, 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 I'm meditating on what God said. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm gonna use all my creativity to imagine what the other side of the lake looks like. I've put my faith in a God that's in the bottom of my boat. It's funny, I get to do this for, for my life. Like this is, a, I love doing this. Which means like when I leave here, I go to Illinois and then after Illinois, I'll be in Tampa and then I get to go home. So I get picked up by random strangers all the time. Like I get picked up by strangers from the airport two, three times a week. I don't know their driving record. I, I don't know if they've had a DUI. I have no idea. I literally have no clue. No clue if I'm gonna make it to the hotel. I, I just never know. Do you wanna know what I never do? <laughs> First of all, I buckle up. I never fall asleep when a stranger's driving me around anywhere. <laughs> never, never. It doesn't matter how much I love August, I love him and his beard. But I'm not falling asleep while August is driving me around. It's just not happening. Like, I know August, but I don't know him like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, just strangers picking me up. Nope, seatbelt. Sometimes I get in the back seat. I'm like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just in the back. Just, uh, I can't. My nerves can't take it. You know what's funny? When I go back home, Typically, Sam Perkins or Jesse or one of the guys that works for our ministry, they pick me up from the airport. And they'd be like midnight, one o'clock in the morning. And I'm like dog tired. I've been preaching, been traveling. You know what the first thing I do? Oh, I recline that chair, <sighs> lean back. And I fall asleep before we even leave the airport. I mean, I'm just knocked out. You know why I fall asleep in the car with them? Because I trust them. Can I tell you something? You're angry that Jesus has fallen asleep in your boat in the middle of your storm. But that communicates a lot of trust in you, that he would fall asleep not only in a vessel with you, but while there's a storm, because he believes that you heard that you're getting to the other side of the lake. And he's trusting in you to bring him where? To the other side of the lake. Because there's people that Jesus has to minister to at the other side of the lake. Before you got in the boat, come on. You know what the enemy likes to tell us? If we get in Jesus' boat, there won't be storms. You actually want to know the reality? The quickest way to get in a storm is get in the boat with Jesus. <laughs> it's the easiest way to get into a storm. Come on, the devil's a liar. The Christian life isn't an easier life. <laughs> it's a way more difficult life. Jesus said the goal isn't to make your life easier, it's to make your life better, better, better. Not easier you may get you may I don't know who I'm talking to right now but maybe there's someone in the room you got saved recently you became a Christian recently and you don't understand how all literal hell has broken loose in your life right after you gave your life to God can I tell you why guess what baby before you were a Christian the enemy had no reason to fight you or oppose you you and the devil were moving in the same direction you were on his team the moment you gave your life to God, you became a traitor. <laughs> There's a bounty on your head. And 
the enemy has released all the powers of hell to get you back. And so now there's a storm and you're trying to figure out how did I give my life to God and my life got worse? <laughs> because now you have an enemy to fight. You've aligned yourself with someone who's got some enemies and your friends are his friends and your enemies are his enemies. It's like the mafia. And God's got a massive enemy named Satan. Satan doesn't just hate you, he hates God. That's why he attacks you. Can I tell you something? I want to prophesy over your life. You've got to get to the other side of the lake. You've got to get to the other side of the lake. And I don't know what you need to do. I don't know what strength has to happen on the inside of you, but you've got to get to the other side of the lake. This is not the end. And we rebuke the lie of the enemy that tells you it's never going to get better and this is rock bottom and there's no point in waking up tomorrow. We rebuke every suicidal thought that the enemy has ever tried to send your way and we reach into the depths of hell and we say your faith is coming back and we're putting your faith back into its right place. God, I ask that you would resurrect faith today in the room. God, we rebuke storms, not because storms are raging, but because the storms won want our faith and they want our allegiance and they want our trust so we rebuke every storm if you're in the room right now and you're like man pastor manny i need you to pray for me i'm in a storm just lift up your hand i want to pray for you if you're like i'm in a storm i feel like the enemy is just like distracting me i feel like my faith is in the wrong place just slip your hand up i want to pray for you god i pray for my brother and my sister pray for everyone with their hand raised right now. God, I declare over their life a circumcised ear, an ability to hear you like never before, an ability to have trust and faith in God. We declare right now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So God, I ask that this week would be a booster shot for our faith, that Lord God, that you would resurrect our faith, that you would speak clearly. And God, we put a hedge of protection around their ears, that the enemy can not influence their thoughts for anyone struggling with their thoughts I declare right now your mind belongs to God your mind belongs to God the enemy is not going to manipulate your creativity and turn it into anxiety the enemy is not going to manipulate your focus and turn it into worry we declare right now in the name of Jesus faith come alive we ask you Holy Spirit to do what only you can do all I can do is talk but God you can break chains and you can destroy bondages so God we ask that your power would be in the room in the mighty name of Jesus we seal it with your blood and we declare that by your son's name it is done it is done I want to speak that over your life whatever you're worried about right now it is done Jesus said it is done on Calvary it's done already it's done already come on God we accept everything you have for us everything you have for us hallelujah Jesus God seal every word seal every word we love you we honor you God we know another service has to come in but we just want to be sensitive to the moment God we ask that you would move this week in a mighty way and God, I ask a specific prayer for accelerated time, that what it would take 25 years of counseling to get through, that God, could you do it in three days this week? Could you do it? Could you just do it? Could you fix it? Could you just be strong like that? Can you be God like that? We need you. We're desperate for you. Your word says if your people would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, you'd heal our land. So God, our land needs healing. So God, we consecrate ourselves to the church this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, can we say amen all around the room? Come on, amen, amen. I love you guys.